My name is uh, Dr. Iron Snavely. I'm the uh, Rare Books Librarian here at the State Library. And uh, this uh, uh, session has was postponed, actually, uh, because of inclement weather. Um, but uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Nyberg from the uh, Army War College in Carlisle. Uh, he's here to talk about uh, the World War I armistice. Uh, and that was originally scheduled for Armistice Day. Uh, we have a small exhibit here on my right uh, with some of our materials on World War I, the Armistice, and the Versailles Peace Treaty. But uh, let me just tell you a bit about Dr. Nyberg. Uh, he's professor of history and chair of war studies at the United States uh, Army War College in Carlisle, uh, where he teaches history, strategy, and international relations to American and international security professionals. Um, his public, published works specializes on the First and Second World Wars in a global context. Um, the Wall Street Journal named his Dance of the Furies, um, Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, one of the five best books ever written about the, uh, that war. And in October 2016, uh, Oxford University Press publishes Path to War, a history of uh, American responses to the Great War in Europe, 1914 to 1917. And in July of uh, 2017, uh, the Oxford University Press published its concise history of the Treaty of uh, Versailles. So I think we're in very good hands uh, and uh, to have someone explain all of that World War I history to us. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nyberg. Thanks. Well, I'm not going to explain the entire war in 45 minutes. I'm not sure I can do that. Uh, sorry, what I do want to do is uh, talk about a part of the First World War that I learned nothing about in high school, nothing about in college, nothing about in graduate school, nothing about ever. And that is how the United States ended up getting involved in this in the first place. So I don't know what all of you learned, but I learned that there was a war in Europe, a boat got sunk, Woodrow Wilson was somehow involved, and all of a sudden the U.S. is involved. Um, and this lack of understanding of this just made the whole period completely confusing to me. So what I want to do is walk you through what happens with the United States from 1914 to 1917, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about the armistice or anything else that you'd like to talk about. And I'm especially delighted to do it here because some of the first work that I did was downstairs in rare books looking at pamphlets that Pennsylvanians had produced in the, this period, 1914 to 1917. And what I want to do is walk you through basically three periods. The first is from the outbreak of the war until about the sinking of the Lusitania, that boat that ends up in every history book. Um, and that's a period when the United States is trying best as it can to stay neutral, although a very self-interested neutrality. And that's where this postcard comes from, this first period of the war, when the United States is trying to maintain, again, a definition of neutrality that it understands, and the way that it understands that neutrality. So there's an American bull terrier in the middle, surrounded by an English bulldog, not terribly threatening German dachshund, even though it's got the spike helmet, um, a very intimidating French bulldog and a Russian wolfhound. And the American dog says, I'm neutral, but I'm not afraid of any of them. This is again from 1915. The second phase is from the sinking of the Lusitania until about the beginning of 1917 when the United States is all of a sudden faced with having to make a series of decisions. The, the reason the Lusitania is important is not that it brought the United States into the war, that's two years away still, but it is the period when Americans stop talking about the war as something that they can stay out of. They now start worrying that the war will drive them in and they have to answer a really difficult series of questions, many of which they don't in the end answer, about what they want to do about it. And then the third period is this period beginning around the turn of the year, 1917, when events start happening really, really fast. One of which is Germany's decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. Another is the first Russian Revolution, which takes the Tsar out of the picture. And then the really dramatic one, which is the Zimmerman telegram, and I'll talk about all of them as we move forward. So what I want to do, though, is start off 
by introducing you to this man, uh, Walter Hines Page, who is a North Carolina newspaper editor from Wilmington, North Carolina, an early backer of Woodrow Wilson's in 1912. Wilson rewarded him by sending him to London to be the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain. When the war began, uh, Walter Hines Page wrote a letter to Wilson in which he said this. He said, now and ever, I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean. Thank God we are out of it. In other words, this isn't our fight. Our job will be to provide assistance and charity where we can, but this isn't our fight. Now, what's interesting to me is that by October 1915, he's writing this letter. If Germany wins, the Monroe Doctrine will be shot through. We shall have to have a great army and navy. And I always pause here when I talk to military audiences to remind them that he meant this negatively. He meant that America's security, which we had been able to have very cheap and without conscription like the European armies had done, European societies had done, we were now going to have to think about going down that road. And Walter Hines Page thought that was a very bad thing for America, that we were going to have to do that. But suppose in England wins, we shall then have merely an academic dispute with her. It is a matter of life or death for English-speaking civilization. What I was really interested in is that transition from thank God we are out of it, thank heaven we are out of it, thank God we are out of it, to life or death. And he's not the only one making this transformation, but he's making it a little earlier than most Americans, and he's making it a little more forcefully. So in the summer of 1916, he came back to the United States. He went to the White House to try to talk to Wilson, to say, you have to get the United States ready. You've got to get us prepared for this. And Wilson refused to see him. So Walter Hines Page went to New Jersey, the Jersey Shore, where Wilson had a summer house called Shadow Lawn, and he literally sat on the president's front porch waiting for Wilson to show up. That's how seriously he took this. And again, he's not the only one, but to me, he's a really interesting representative of this problem. Americans were looking at this war from the very beginning. They had their eyes on it from the very beginning. So my daughter's own history textbook said that Americans ignored the war. Nothing could be further from the truth. And this is easy to demonstrate here in this building, I'm sure, just looking at American newspapers. This is one from Pittsburgh. Uh, the Pittsburgh Gazette Times. You're going to see a lot of stuff about Pittsburgh. I apologize and don't apologize for that. It is Pennsylvania. It's where I'm from. It's totally appropriate. <laughs> uh, this is the Gazette Times telling its readership that it has signed on through the New York Sun to get the reporting of Richard Harding Davis, then the highest paid journalist in America. He had been with Theodore Roosevelt on San Juan Hill. He had covered every major war for the past 20 or 25 years. When he heard about this war breaking out, he hopped on the very first ship he could get on, which turned out to be the HMS Lusitania, and went right to the Western Front. And this is the Pittsburgh Gazette Times telling um, their readers, we've got Richard Harding Davis, subscribe to us. When the First World War broke out, as many of you know, the United States was still on the gold standard. There were no controls over that gold. So European economies, European governments, started selling the securities they had in American companies, translating that cash into gold, and getting the gold back to Europe. The United States government, aware that that would literally bleed the gold out of the United States, shut down the New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia stock exchanges from August 1914 until after Thanksgiving, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed to control that gold flow. So if you think this isn't impacting Americans, you're wrong, and I'll show you in a bit what that does to the economy. Initially a tailspin, and then it's going to recover very, very quickly. So this is something Americans are talking about. They know it's the biggest event in world history for at least their lifetimes, and they know that whatever happens in Europe will affect the future course of the United States. I want to introduce you to another person. She's also from Pittsburgh. Uh, this is Mary Roberts Reinhardt. She is a mystery author and well-known um, progressive Republican, also close to Theodore Roosevelt, Ro wrote a lot of muckraking uh, magazine articles. She went by the nickname the American Agatha Christie, though I've read some of her mystery stories and I don't actually think they're very good, but she was very popular in her day. Uh, she's from Swickley, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. And when the war broke out, she was attending a dinner held in New York City for the Saturday Evening Post, a magazine she had worked for, when the editor of the Saturday Evening Post stood up and made an announcement. And he said that he had arranged for her to be the first female reporter to go into the trenches. He had also arranged for her to meet with the king and queen in England, the Kaiser and his wife in Germany, the president and his wife in France. And if she would go, he would pay her $1,000 per article, which is still a lot of money, which is still not bad. So this is a tremendous offer. The story goes that her husband stood up and said, no, this is my wife, I forbid her from going. And Mary Roberts Reinhardt is supposed to have stood up 
and said, I do not to intend to let the greatest thing in the history of my life go by and not see it. So she went. And what's very interesting to me about her uh, trip, as well as Richard Harding Davis's and others, is the transition that they go through from the time that they both go in the fall of 1914, and others as well, until the time that she came back just before the sinking of the Lusitania. She came back in March of 1915. And what I want to do is just cover a couple of themes that she and Davis and other reporters all covered. The first is that she wrote before leaving that she was going to go to Europe and condemn both sides. That this had been a classic screw up by everybody and she was going to expose the idiocy all over the place. As soon as she got to Europe though, her mind started to change. As did Davis's, as did many others. And she began to write articles arguing that it really was Germany that had started the war. France was in the war because German armies had invaded French soil. Britain was in the war to defend an international order that Germany was violating. Richard Harding Davis comes to the same conclusion. Second, though, she warned her readers, as did Davis, that the British were lying. The British were inflating atrocities in Belgium. They were telling their people things that weren't true, and they were trying to tell the American people things that weren't true, to drag the Americans into the war. What she and Davis both said is, don't believe what the British are telling you, believe what we've seen with our own eyes. Richard Harding Davis was in the Belgian university town of Louvain when the Germans burned it, and wrote about what he had seen with his own two eyes. He and Mary Roberts Reinhardt both refused to retell stories that the British were telling them unless they could independently verify them. Very interesting uh, interpretation for both. Third, she saw that the United States had a clear interest in seeing Britain and France win the war, but she also argued that the United States should not get involved in the war unless America's interests were threatened. Until that point, the United States should only support the British and French to the extent that they could, without getting involved. And fourth, she warned in really strong language that the United States probably would be unable to determine the timing and the nature of when it got involved in the war. So President Wilson and the United States had to start getting ready now, a movement that became known as preparedness, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. But to build up a bigger navy, get the army ready to go, get the people ready to go, and start to organize the country in the event that the U.S. would have to go to war. Um, Richard Hardy Davis made the same argument, but he argued, as did many Americans, that if you built a strong enough army and navy, the Europeans wouldn't push the United States around. But to the extent that the army and navy were unable to defend American interests, the U.S. would be at the mercy of the Europeans. This is a page from her diary. She came back to the U.S., as I mentioned, just before the sinking of the Lusitania. And as I mentioned earlier, the sinking of the Lusitania is the event that forces the question. What do you now want to do about this war in Europe? And there is no consensus opinion among Americans. There are some, like the former President Theodore Roosevelt, who wanted a very tough response, break diplomatic relations with Germany, threaten them with war, build up an army, build up a navy, get the United States ready to go. There are others, like the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who said that's the exact opposite way to, that, that I want to do it. He proposed that if Europe was too dangerous and the high seas were too dangerous, just ban Americans from traveling overseas. Insulate the U.S. from what's going on overseas. Insulate us from the fire that's happening around in the corner, as he said. Wilson wants to try to chart a middle course, force the Germans to admit that they've done something bad, force the Germans to back off of the policy of sinking ships, but don't take the major step of breaking diplomatic relations with the Germans. That's what he did, uh, and as many of you know, uh, it causes William Jennings Bryan to resign as Secretary of State, the first of two very high-profile resignations from Wilson's cabinet over Wilson's wartime policies. And I'll talk about the other one here in just a bit. The Lusitania also increases American anger at Germany, not necessarily Germans, but the German government. And I can talk about the distinction Americans made in that, if anybody would like. Uh, there is a rise, not just because of the sinking of the Lusitania, but also because of a number of other events. I came across this cartoon from the New York Tribune in October of 1915. It's one of two documents I'm gonna show you here, one of two images that really kind of struck me when I first saw it. This is one showing Kaiser Wilhelm with an Ottoman fez on his head, holding an Ottoman scimitar with blood dripping off of it. And the caption reads, a la Mittums, which is a takeoff on the German belt buckles, which read, got Mittums. In other words, the accompanying text explains, the Americans believe that the massacre of the Armenians in 1915 was not only the fault of the Ottomans, but that it was directed by the Germans. 
There's also a series of sabotage incidents in the United States, the largest and most deadliest, most expensive act of terrorism in America prior to 9-11 occurred in Jersey City, New Jersey in the summer of 1916, the so-called Black Tom uh, uh, incident, which was done by two German agents that then left the United States and made their way to Mexico. At the end of 1916, Wilson had to declare two German diplomats for Sonoma and Grana had been kicked out of the United States. The first telephone tap in American history is done to spy on the German social club at Central Park South, where the Americans believed, and they were right, the Germans were running an espionage ring. The German government was running an espionage ring. More and more events. There's a, there's a bridge between Vanceboro, Maine, and Nova Scotia that the Germans try to blow up. There's another attempt to blow up the Welland Canal. All of these things that get traced back to this cell that's based in New York City. So the question becomes, what should the United States do about this growing threat to the United States? As I mentioned, those in favor of doing something rally around the word preparedness. Um, now, what ends up happening, for reasons I can talk about, because I personally find them really fascinating, President Wilson made the decision to put money into a slightly larger Navy and to put money into a very slightly larger Army, but not to make any major changes. And his refusal to do anything about preparedness caused the second big resignation from his cabinet. That was the Secretary of War, William Lindley Garrison, and his Assistant Secretary of War, Henry Breckinridge, and I can talk about this because I personally find it absolutely fascinating. But what I find really fascinating, maybe more fascinating than that, is when Wilson didn't do anything, the American people stepped into the valley. <clears throat> Not all of them, but many of them. Just to give you a few examples, Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic formed a committee of American medical preparedness, which ended up with chapters in every state in the country. They wrote reports in 1916 predicting that the global crisis that the war was creating would eventually cause some sort of pandemic. They guessed it would be influenza. They guessed that it would be, the time was now, they argued, to start doing something about it, but nobody took that report with sufficient severity to do anything about it. Thomas Edison formed an American Committee of Scientific Preparedness to try to get the American scientific community together. They ended up working very closely with the US Navy to work on naval technologies. One of my favorite examples comes from Columbia University, who had a pacifist president, Nicholas Murray Butler. Bur Nicholas Murray Butler. Um, he made a decision in 1916 as part of preparedness that what he would do, the US Army is divided into what's called a G staff. So G1 is personnel, G2 is intel, G3 is operations, G4 is logistics, all the way down. It's a pacifist doing this. He sent a memo to the Columbia University faculty in which he said, this is the Army's G system. Please put your name on this form where your services can best help the nation in an emergency. And every single member of the faculty of Columbia University put their names on that form. The history department, I find this amazing as a historian, took lead to do calisthenics every day at noon to encourage Columbia's young men to get in better shape. Some of you may know about the Plattsburgh movement, where young men voluntarily went up to the wilds of upstate New York and paid out of their own pockets to be yelled at by retired military officers. Um, nobody thought this was going to produce an officer corps for the United States. What they wanted, what Theodore Roosevelt really wanted, was to shame Woodrow Wilson into doing something, anything, to get the country ready. And again, this is my favorite example of it. This, this is an ad from AT&T. And you can see, here's Paul Revere right here, 1775. And here's an American military officer, 1916, on the telephone. And the ad reads, in its wonderful preparedness to inform its citizens of a national need, the United States stands alone and unequaled. It can command the entire Bell Telephone system, which completely covers our network, our country, with its network of wires. If the government won't do it, corporations will step in. Powell Evans, who was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, began a corporate initiative. Any young man that wanted to engage in military training, this pot of money would guarantee their job and pay their salary while they did it. Now again, I want to stress, this isn't a pro-war initiative. These are people making the argument that if the United States is strong, it will be able to determine its own future. If the United States is weak, then either the victors, either the allies, or Germany, or some combination, might be able to push the United States into doing something it doesn't want to do. Now, supporters of preparedness, like um, Lindley Garrison, the Secretary of War, wanted a much stronger response from Wilson. Garrison proposed throwing out the National Guard system, by which the United States military is still organized, though it's different than it is in 1960. 
and getting rid of it completely. Garrison looked at the way the U.S. military was organized with the National Army commanded by the President and 48 National Guards commanded by 48 governors with 48 standards of training, 48 different systems of promotion, 48 different cultures. And he, being a progressive, said that's a ridiculous way to organize an army. We're going to get rid of all of it and we're going to replace it with what he called the Continental Army Plan. Triple the size of the army and have it report only to officials in Washington, D.C. You can guess, who do you think opposed this idea? 48 governors <laughs> and most members of the House of Representatives. And Garrison, being a northern progressive, argued that if you're going to get the number of people you want in the U.S. Army, it has to be done without regard to race, which earned him the hatred of most members of the southern delegations of the House of Representatives. As a result, Wilson refused to back the plan. That's what led Garrison to resign. So the compromise was a piece of legislation called the 1916 National Defense Act. I won't go into all of it, though it's fascinating. It kept the National Guard in place, but it insisted that the National Guard had to meet standards of training set from Washington. The thing that drove Garrison crazy is it took money away from modernization programs of the U.S. Army and gave it to the states to do it, meaning that the Army didn't get the development money Garrison wanted. It created something called a Reserve Officer Training Corps program, ROTC, to take the energy out of those Plattsburgh programs that private citizens were doing, and it built a much larger Navy, or at least pledged money for a much larger Navy. But it didn't go nearly far enough for people like Garrison and others. Now, economics are a huge factor as well. I found this one in the Newberry Library in Chicago. I was in Chicago actually on vacation, decided with it, my daughters and my wife were going to go shopping. I said, I don't really feel like going shopping. I'm going to go to the Newberry Library and just see what they've got. And I found the complete cartoons of John McCutcheon, the first American to win the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning in the 1920s. This is one he did in 1915, right before the Lusitania scene. And take a look at it. It's brilliant. Here are the docks of New York City, literally as magnets, pulling money away from London, Berlin, and Paris, while an American banker sits in a boat called the Money Center of the World with Uncle Sam with his arms wide open. Americans knew this war could make them fabulously rich. American per capita income went up 28% between 1914 and 1916. 28%. It's remarkable. Now, why did that happen? Basically, two reasons. One reason is anything the Americans can produce, anything they can grow, anything they can manufacture, they can sell to one of the warring parties. The state of Tennessee sold its entire tobacco crop in one sale to the French government. That's remarkable. You can imagine what an industrial state like Pennsylvania could do. Right? Now, what's important to me about this is not just two things are really important. Not just how much money the Americans were making, but by nature of the way America defined its neutrality, and by nature of the way that the world shipping, credit, insurance, all of that functioned, most of this financial assistance, most of this financial deals are going to the British and the French. And Americans commented on this. Our money, our assistance, our food, our manufacturing is going to the two countries we want to see win the war. There's no contradiction between us making money and supporting the side we want. Though there is a caveat to that that I want to explain. There is also the fact that many Americans used to buy a lot of products from Europe that are now no longer available from European manufacturers because of the war. 1915 was the greatest year by far for American Bible sales because European publishers aren't making Bibles anymore. Americans have to buy those from people in the United States. The same is true of fountain pens, bicycles, eyeglasses, all down the line. Everybody's making money. When we first moved back to Pennsylvania about eight years ago, I, my wife on Mother's Day likes to go to Bellingrath and all these other lovely gardens that are in southeast Pennsylvania. The cornerstones to almost all of the gardens are 1920, 1921, 1922. So I couldn't help it. I said to my wife, this is war profiteering. That's what built these lovely gardens, right? The Japan family built one of them. Where do you think the money is coming from? This is where it's coming from. Now, that's good and bad. You can see the American trade balance from 1914 alone. In August, the United States had a net negative trade balance. Look how different that is by December when the United States has a $130 million trade surplus. Everybody is making money. Everybody is making money. What's the problem with that? Well, 
problem comes from people like Mary Roberts Reinhardt and others who argue that there's a real moral problem if the United States believes that Britain and France should win the war, but all we're doing is making money off it. And this is her comment, that Pittsburgh is fattening on catastrophe, which she wrote shortly after Westinghouse had signed a major deal to make shells for the British. When I was in Nashville doing research for this project, I came across, again, pure luck. I came across an archive of the First Presbyterian Church in Nashville. They have a complete record of Sunday sermons. And a major theme of the Sunday sermons in 1916 is that the United States is committing a moral sin by making money off the catastrophe in Europe. One whole series of sermons was titled, Have We a Right to Our Present Prosperity? Remarkable. Remarkable. What do you do about that if you're American? Well, one way you can get around it is to give at least a portion of that money to charities. And my friend Julia Irwin, a professor at the University of South Florida, Julia estimates that Americans gave at least in present-day dollars, at least $125 billion. At least. That's an enormous amount of money. Now, on the local level, me being from Pittsburgh, Kennywood Park, our wonderful amusement park, when I was growing up, had Serbia Day, Polish Day, Hungarian Day. I figured it was just an excuse to find someone of that ethnic origin to get a cheap ticket, eat some good food, and ride the rides. It actually begins in 1915 with Serbia Day, where all the profits from that day were donated to Serbia. The Ivy League proposed that a whole Saturday that all college football games, all the proceeds, would go to the relief of Belgium and France. Now, even then, college football ran the show and the university president said no, but they did pass out buckets that people put a lot of money into. They raised more money than they had expected. John Wanamaker in Philadelphia raised $100 million for Belgium alone. Philadelphia raised enough money to buy two entire field hospitals for France in one hour. The overwhelming majority of that money went to three places. It went to France, it went to Belgium, and it went to Serbia. On a fourth, it went to help the Jews of Poland, whose communities were getting run over as the armies moved back and forth. In other words, almost all of that money is going to the Allies. $125 billion of charity. It's remarkable, and you can do it today still. This is after the war, this continues too. You can go to a church on the, on the Western Front that has a plaque rebuilt by the people of Meadville, Pennsylvania. Meadville, not a big place. Not a big place. Hometown of Sharon Stone, but not a big place. Some people did more than just offer their money. These are men of the Lafayette Escadrille. They're Americans. This guy right here, Billy Thaw, is the guy who came up with the idea. Where do you think Billy Thaw is from? Born, raised, and buried? Pittsburgh, thank you. Billy Thaw got the idea. A bunch of rich Americans. These are rich Americans who could easily stayed in New York City or Pittsburgh or wherever they were, but a bunch of rich Americans who thought America was doing the wrong thing by sitting on the sidelines, gave up their own money to join the Lafayette Escadrille. These are all Americans flying in the service of France. Theodore Roosevelt loved them, wrote articles in American magazines. Cornelius Vanderbilt gave them a line of credit in France. Spend whatever you want, it's on me. This is what we think Americans should do. And these guys embraced every minute of it. They had lion cubs as mascots. That's whiskey and soda that you see there. Right? I wouldn't want to be the poor little puppy on the far right. They amassed an unbelievably good combat record. I think, though I can't prove it, this is where fighter pilot top gun culture comes from. The American government had, could not discipline them because they weren't in an American chain of command. And the French had no incentive to discipline them. So these guys did whatever they wanted. They flew in their bathrobes and set them in uniforms. There was a report that Thaw had been killed in combat over the Western Front. They held a memorial dinner for him at the Waldorf Astoria. Billy Thaw showed up at the dinner. <laughs> they did whatever they wanted. Right. They're on the front lines. A Canadian colleague of mine, Jonathan Vance, estimates that 80,000, 80,000 members of the Canadian Army in World War I were born in the United States. 80,000. Even if that number is off by a factor of two, that means 40,000, and even if half of those were Canadians living in the U.S. who went back, that still leaves 20,000 American citizens. There's another study that estimates maybe 12,000 Americans may have joined the French army through the consulate in New Orleans where it was legal to do that. Remarkable. And some of you know the famous names of Americans who were over there, Ernest Hemingway, um, the, pilot, the poet whose name is escaping me now, uh, the trees guy. Um, 
No, no, uh, Coldstream Guards killed on the Psalm. I can remember that, but I can't remember his name. Joyce Kilmer, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's sons are over there. Right? Lots of Americans putting their lives on the line. So I explain why American sympathies are pro-French and pro-British. I didn't explain this decision that the whole talk is about, which is why the United States makes this fateful decision. So let me go to that. I'm in the New York Public Library. I'm rooting through some microfilm, and I come across this image. It's another one of those things when you're a researcher, you stop yourself, and you make sure you're actually seeing what you think you're seeing. And here it is. It's the cover of Life magazine from February 1916. I want to explain a little bit of what I think is going on, because it's just a cover image. There was no text to accompany it. Okay, you'll note that most of the United States is labeled New Prussia. I would like you also to note that Mexico is labeled as the province of Mexico, with Wilhelmsburg as its capital. Baja California is called Austriana. The west coast is called Japonica. And Florida is called Turconia. I'd like you also to notice that north of the border, is all labeled as barbarians. I'm showing this map in Canada in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is a reference to the Canadians. Here's what I think is going on. And it, 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 I, can, I can corroborate this by other reports, other evidence. What Americans are afraid of is that if the war goes badly for Britain and France, the British and French will do what the British and French have done for centuries. What do they do when a war in Europe is going badly? The answer is they trade other parts of their possessions. Okay, that's how Pittsburgh goes from being French to British. That's how Canada goes, Quebec goes from being French to British. Here's what Americans are afraid of. If the war is going badly in 1916 for the French and British, one way the French and British might try to get out of it is by trading possessions that they have in the New World for a better deal in regards to Europe. Remember, that includes Jamaica. That includes the French islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, which are at the mouth of the St. Lawrence. That includes Martinique. Remember, the Panama Canal opened in 1914. Americans are worried about Caribbean security. In 1916, the U.S. bought the Danish Virgin Islands from Denmark for exactly this reason, the fear that Germany would grab them. I think the Canadians as barbarians is the fear that the Germans might take in a peace deal Halifax, the great Canadian naval base of Esquimalt out west. It's not great anymore, but there used to be capital ships out there. There's now one. I actually was out there a couple of years ago and saw it. But jokingly, we called it the Her Majesty's ship, the uh, Canadian royal vessel Wayne Gretzky. It's one tiny little <laughs> ship. It's not much of a naval base, but it used to be, and the port is fantastic. Maybe it's Toronto, Niagara, that they take. Can America exist? with a strategic situation at the end of the war with Germany controlling colonies in the Caribbean, parts of Canada, and potentially an alliance with Mexico, which, remember, is going through a revolution. It's what we would today call a failed state. Is that a future that the United States can live with? It is a future that could happen if the United States does nothing. Now, I can imagine people talking about this cover in their homes, in saloons, in their offices, and saying, boy, these people must be out of their minds. Nothing like this could ever happen. Do me a favor and hold that in your head for just a minute. Imagine you're someone that looks at this and says, it'll never happen. This is some lunatic in New York drawing a map for the cover of a magazine. Things start to get a little worse, and they start to get a little worse really fast. March 9, 1916, Pancho Villa raided Columbus, New Mexico, killing 20 Americans. He brought with him a woman named Maud Hawks and then released her, or she escaped, depending on which version of the story you believe. American officials interviewed her. She told them that Pancho Villa had bragged about plans to, quote, kill everybody in the United States, and that he would be helped by Germany and Japan. James Garrard, the American ambassador in Berlin, reported back to Washington, quote, most Germans think that America's Mexico troubles are to their advantage. I am sure that Pancho Villa's attack was made in Germany. Every night, 50 million Germans cry themselves to sleep, because all of Mexico has not yet risen against us. And remember, this is a time period when the Germans actually do start a rebellion in Dublin. The British actually do start rebellions inside the Ottoman Empire. This is not unusual. This is happening. And Americans are watching it all happen. Now remember this map, right? Insane, lunatic, this would never happen, right? February, this telegram is intercepted by British intel people and given to the United States. I can talk more about it if anybody would like. It reads in part, we Germany, this is a message that's going from Germany, from Berlin to Washington, 
because the U.S. is still neutral, the Germans can still use American telegraph cables. Then it's sent from Washington to Mexico City on U.S. telegraph cables, a fact that many Americans respond to quite angrily. And the message reads, we intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the President of Mexico of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States is certain and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence. Now your friend at the office pulls out that map. Now what does it look like? And a couple of days later, Zimmerman is, I can tell you the story of the telegram because it's fascinating, but it, it takes a while to tell. Zimmerman is asked in Berlin, hey, the American media is reporting on this telegram. You really didn't send that, did you? And Zimmerman, knowing he's caught, says, yes, I sent it. I sent it. Now the Germans have admitted that this is what they're going to try to do. Now how do you feel as an American? Is this war about Belgium? No. Is this war about the security of Great Britain? No. It's about looking at a potential future in which, and remember, the telegram specifically says it's going to be a Germany-Mexico-Japanese alliance with potential German victories in the Caribbean and Canada. Is that something the United States can live with? And the answer, of course, is no. This happens in late February, early March. I can talk about it, but I don't think Woodrow Wilson is a part of this at all. I think he's a bit of flotsam in a river that's being pulled along. The states of New York and Massachusetts call out their national guards. Mary Roberts Reinhardt says this is a declaration of war. Theodore Roosevelt says if the president doesn't declare war after this, I will go down to the White House, and I'm quoting here, I will skin him alive. Two members of Wilson's cabinet, including his own son-in-law, the Treasury Secretary, William Gibbs McAdoo, Tell Wilson, if you don't declare war, Congress will declare it without you, and we will resign. You don't have a choice. They're declaring war on you. What are you waiting for? Wilson comes out and gives a speech that has since been known as the uh, Overt Act speech, in which he says, I know what the Germans have said. I don't think they're actually going to do it. I'm going to wait for the Overt Act. There's an American reporter named Floyd Gibbons who's on a ship, the SS Laconia. He's on his way to Europe to cover the outbreak of the entry of the United States into a war which he thinks is imminent. The Germans torpedo that ship. He's sitting in a lifeboat in the middle of the frozen North Atlantic when a British friend of his rows his lifeboat over and says to Floyd Gibbons, who now has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, he says to Gibbons, is this your bloody overt act or not? And Gibbons looks at him and says, I don't know. I don't know what the president has decided. He hasn't moved yet. I want to finish with one more slide, then we can talk about whatever you want to answer as many questions as I can. I want to come back to Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who publishes this in March 1917 in the Saturday Evening Post, which means she probably wrote it in February, in the wake of the Zimmerman telegram. And she's angry. Why hasn't the president done anything? And this is what she says. If in this war we allow the few to fight for us, then as a nation we have died and our ideals have died with us. Though we win, if we all have not borne this burden alike, then do we all lose. What she means here is this is a war for the future of the United States. This is an existential war forced on us by the Europeans. And if we don't win it, the United States could stop to exist as a, as a nation state. As a result, she argues, there can be no substitution like we had in the Civil War. Everybody's got to participate equally. And again, she is a mother of two teenage sons. So this is not a light thing for her to write. We are virtually at war. By the time this is published, perhaps the declaration will have been made. In other words, she expects that Woodrow Wilson will have brought the country into the war. He hasn't. Then she writes, America is the last stand of the humanities on earth, the realization of a dream, and the fulfillment of an ideal. And again, what she's arguing here is Britain and France have been on the front line defending that, and not us. We have wasted two years when we should have been getting ready for this, and now we're not. And she says, now my sons are going to have to join an army that is not ready to fight this war. Then at the end she writes, under the domination of the Prussians, and again I can talk about this if anybody wants, a critical distinction Americans made in 1970 between Germans and Prussians. 
Under the domination of the Prussians, Imperial Germany now threatened those values, not only in Europe, but in America itself, for, quote, it had broken loose something terrible, something that must be killed or the world dies. And what I think is happening here is Americans are not entering this war so much with enthusiasm as determination. We've tried everything else, and our situation has just gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. And the way that I've been describing this to folks is I think of this like an hourglass. When the war first began in 1914, Americans had wide varying opinion on what they ought to do. By April 1917, they're all down to one option. 95, 98% of them are down to one option. We've tried everything else, we have to go to war. On November 11, 1918, when the armistice is signed, then the thing starts to open up again as Americans disagree about what ought to happen in the post-war world. But at this moment, late March, early April 1917, the United States has fully agreed Something terrible, something that must be killed or the world dies. <clears throat> Thanks, I know that you guys want to get back to jobs, so let me stop and see if there's any questions that I can answer. Yes, sir. When you had that illustration of uh, the, the new Prussia and all that, there was, there's, yeah, there's a, a cut out there above Mexico. Uh, in, in I love that. It's well, called the American it? Reservation, ah. <laughs> with, with Goose Step as the capital. Right. I love that. And of course, what this is, is a fear. I don't know quite what the right Freudian term is, that, though, that just as the United States took the indigenous people and pushed them into a reservation, that's what the Germans are going to do to us. Right. And there's a series of teen fiction books. They're kind of the red dawn of their, their time. Uh, the defense of Washington, the defense of Pittsburgh, and the defense of Cincinnati. And it's about the army has collapsed. And it's this group of teenagers that are holding the line. Again, first in D.C., then in Pittsburgh, then in Cincinnati, until they finally win the war. So th this fear is out there, uh, that this is what the Germans are going to do. Um, so yeah, that's what that's referring to, the American Reservation, which is, you couldn't draw it up any better. As an historian, I couldn't have created this source any better than it was. And the two cities that are up here in Idaho, uh, one is called Von Poppen, the other is called Boyed City. Those are the two, Von Poppen and Boyed are the two um, German diplomats that Wilson declared for Sauron and Grom and kicked out of the country. Yes, sir. Yes. Was the Ambulance Corps one of those independent <coughs> initiatives to do something before the war began? It is. It's a private initiative done by uh, first the U.S. Red Cross, and I think there's a group in New York actually called something like the American Ambulance Field Service, yeah. which later becomes the American Field Service. But it's private. It's not connected to the U.S. government. And in fact, Wilson's not really sure what to do. The original name of the Lafayette Escadrille was the American Escadrille, the Escadrille American. Well, sorry, I went the wrong way. And Wilson objected to that, saying this is a violation of American neutrality. And he actually threatened to have all their passports revoked <laughs> until he realized how unbelievably unpopular that would be. <laughs> so they went back and said, okay, we'll change the name to Escadrille Lafayette. But as you can see, they're flying an American flag. I mean, there's no, there's no secret about what they're doing or why they're doing it. Yes, sir? You mentioned a while back that a pandemic was predicted, especially with flu which did occur. Do you know how many people were estimated to have been killed by the flu, at least by modern standards? I don't think they made a numeric estimate. I've read their report. I think they just say something in the level of a global pandemic. I don't think they go to the actual numbers. No, but I mean, do you know what the actual numbers are? Oh, what well, do historians estimate today? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen estimates as high as 45 million. I've seen them as high as 100. Yeah, I've seen nothing lower than 20 million. So it is an enormous, obviously enormous, enormous pandemic. But I don't think anybody knows. I, don't, I haven't seen any range of numbers with any degree of scientific credibility. They're all guesstimates. Simply because there's no way really to estimate India, China, all those places, which wouldn't have kept the right So there's a question here and then in the back. When the war broke out, in our country, Britain established a blockade that prevented trade with Germany and the yeah. Central Powers. The United States pushed back against that at all? They did. The of freedom of the seas and freedom they of did. Um, in fact, there's one study that's done during the war. Um, that the, for the most part, what Britain did is um, either let... Um, this goes back and forth. The, the British government in London is saying, strict blockade, anything the Americans are trying to get to, to Germany or, or Austria-Hungary, we're going to blockade it, we're going to take it, we're going to put the company's name on a blacklist, and we're not going to do business with it. The American ambassador in the United States is saying, whoa, 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 let's, no, that, the, the good relations with the U.S. is more important than that. So it goes back and forth. The big crop, that, the big item that is the, 
issue of dispute is cotton. Cotton is used to pack artillery shells so that they don't bang together while they're in transit. So the British government said, well, that's a, that's a war contraband. Anybody selling cotton to the Germans, we're going we're to steal it. We're going we're gonna to take it. Uh, the position of the United States was, and you can imagine why, cotton's an enormous industry in the United States, that cotton can't be considered a wartime uh, thing. So there actually was a study done in 1922, I think, by the Carnegie Endowment, that said you can actually trace American opposition to Great Britain, that is anti-British feeling in the US, you can actually trace it to cotton states in periods when the British are taking American cotton. So what the British eventually decided to do, quite smartly, I think, it's funded by J.P. Morgan, is just buy the entire American cotton crop, which is what they did in 1917, 1918. So there is anti-British sentiment, but it waxes and wanes, and it appears to be um, quite specific to the South at quite specific times. There's a senator from Georgia, a guy named Pope Smith, who's leading this charge. Um, and it's obvious why, because it's hurting the economy of the state. Cotton's the one crop that doesn't go through that rebound that I showed you. Cotton's the one exception. Yes, sir. Uh, I seem to recall the uh, Japanese ended up coming in on the Allied side. They do. Um, I'm interested to see that they were, I guess, contributing on the Central Powers. Yeah, so they're not, they're not, they're, they're pro-British. They're not pro-American. So what, what happens is there's a deal that gets cut, uh, 19, early 1915, where the British went to the Japanese, which, with whom they already had a, a, a naval alliance. Any German possession that's north of the equator that Japan is sitting on at the end of the war, they'll get to keep. So that's the Marshall, Marianas, and Caroline Islands, which the American army later takes back in, in World War II. It's also the Chinese peninsula of Shandong, which I was actually just going, I'm, I have a paper that's due on this very soon. So before I came here, I was at the Midtown Scholar editing that paper. Uh, the United States, at the end of the war, quite controversially, Wilson backed Japanese claims to these places, much to the fury and anger of the American delegation in Paris, and much to the fury and anger of Australians who didn't want the Japanese creeping this close either. So to the United States, Japan is pro-allied, but they're centered on Britain, they're not centered on the United States. And there is a real wave of anti-Asian, you, you may know about some of these things, the, the so-called gentlemen's agreement, the anti-Asian exclusion acts that are going on. So to the United States, Japan is pro-allied, but they're not pro-US. What Japan's gonna get out of this doesn't help the US. And there's a big, big, big controversy over Shandong. Uh, the man for whom my building is named, Tasker Bliss, who was the senior American military representative in Paris, almost resigned his commission when he found out that Wilson was going to go along with this deal that the British and Japanese had cut. And I can go into it more, but I don't want to go into it. I'm editing a paper on this, so it's, it's in my head, and I haven't talked too long about it. Though so it's fascinating. So there were like 40 million people killed in World War I, and so we, we got in at, in 1917. We declare war in 1917, the first American combat troops, that because we didn't do anything in terms of preparedness, it takes a full year for the American army to Americans do anything. Died in I think 117, 117,000 is the, is the new number. Uh, about half of those from disease. And about two thirds of the remaining number in one campaign in the Meuse Argonne. And is World War I the, the war that has the most killed in it? For the United States? Or for, for. No, World War II vastly. War in World War II, uh, it, and again, it depends on whether you count the flu or not, it depends on how you want to do the mathematics. Um, but World War II kills more people raw number. War, if you don't, if you take the flu out of the equation, World War II kills more civilians than military, which is an inverse of the pattern of World War I. The one nice thing about having a stable Western front, at least in the West, is that not that many civilians are directly impacted in the West, though they are in the East, as the fronts move back and forth. So who lost the most people in World War I? Uh, actually, per capita, it's far and away Serbia far and away. Uh, raw numbers, it's probably Germany, though I, it could be Russia, but I'm guessing it would be Germany. Okay. Sir? It's still not, <clears throat> not clear to me how, how the U.S. sentiment um, went from being relatively neutral to, to favoring Britain and France. Didn't we have economic, um, didn't we have economic interests with Germany that were at least comparable to our... Economy? We do, though they're not comparable. They, they're, it's far in excess. Britain and France, trade with Britain and France is far in excess of what trade is with Germany. Far in excess. Um, what I think is important is that America's wallet, if you will, and its, its sentiment, if you will, are going in the same direction. So from the very first moment the war breaks out, within a couple of weeks, you see Americans with this outpouring of sympathy for Britain and France. 
in this first period, there is some sympathy for Germany as well. And there is a, a very well-known Harvard professor, a guy named Hugo Munsterberg, who's connected to everything. I mean, everything down to like Wonder Woman. He influenced the people that did Wonder Woman. Like, really fascinating guy. He's one of the most prominent pro-German voices. And he gives a series of lectures. He writes a series of letters to the editor in which he says, hey, look, America, you're not seeing this the right way. After the Lusitania is sunk, he just stops giving those public speeches. And he dies of an aneurysm a couple of months later that his friends believe is part of the tension. He couldn't reconcile in his head his support for Germany and then Germany's behavior both over the Lusitania and Belgium and other places. So there is a shift that goes on. So that's what I mean about that hourglass. So at the beginning, there are pro-German American voices, but they start to thin out. And again, when I was in Chicago, there was a, a the, the largest German American group pre 1914 is actually in Chicago. So I went and found their records. They used to host a series of lectures, as you would expect, right? Public affairs lectures. Uh, it would be like finding the archives of this lecture series, right? 1914 to the Lusitania, there are a number of them. You know, Germany's economic interest in the war, um, Russia is the guilty party in the war. After the Lusitania, no more. It's now Bavarian dance and German music and, you know, it's all this stuff to make Germany in a good light, mm -hmm. but no direct discussion of the war at all. So something clearly has, has snapped. Um, and I mentioned this distinction that the Americans make between Prussia and Germany. So you find, 1916, you find plenty of non-Prussian Germans, Bavarians, Württembergers, who come out and say, look, we don't really think a war with Germany isn't obviously the best solution. But if it means destroying the Imperial Prussian government and giving all of Germany a democratic state, we'll support it. So Oswald Villard, the American journalist, um, there's another very famous American journalist whose name is now escaping me, uh, Edward Rumley, whose papers were in Indiana that I looked at. They're making this argument. They're both non-Prussian Germans. So there's a, there's a clear distinction that Americans are making, especially Catholic Bavarians are making. Was so, that around? Yeah, absolutely. He serves as a, a runner in, in, in Belgium in 1915, okay. and then is wounded and goes back to, I can't remember where he goes to. A friend of mine, Thomas Weber, has actually written a book about Hitler's First World War, and Tomas argues that it's less World War I than the revolution in Germany after World War I. He's a more of a soldier. Than he's a soldier. Yeah, he's a private, he's yeah. a message runner. Okay. He's a message runner. Did Germany have any better, uh, were they further ahead at all in the technologies that would become important to the U.S. in the war, like aircraft engines, like flip-flops. In flip-flops, you have moments where Germany has superiority in the air, and then the French figure something out, then the Germans figure something out. The key is, I think, there's no no one has a technological edge that is strong enough or long enough to really make a difference. So every time someone comes up with a, a weapon they think is going to do it, somebody figures out a way to counter that. Um, so the Germans come up with this thing called an interrupter gear. I only know this because I worked with the Air Force for a while, where the machine gun is actually chained in time to the aircraft engine, so that instead of shooting your own propeller off, like in a Looney Tunes cartoon, it actually skips when that bullet would hit the propeller, which is really clever, think about it, from an engineering perspective. And the Allies quickly figure out what they've done, and they, they reverse engineer something similar, and then they end up putting guns on the wing, so that's not a problem, and you know, so there's no technological edge. Um, had the war gone into 1919, the United States Army would have had thousands of airplanes, hundreds of tanks, thousands of trucks. It would have been a fully mechanized army. And that would have, war in 1919 would have looked very, very different. Or if we would have prepared sooner. Sorry? Or if we would have prepared sooner. Or if we had been prepared sooner. Yeah, but the, the reality is the United States, when the American Army goes to Europe, the French are providing almost everything. The U.S. provides the aircraft engines, but the French provide the airframes, I mean, the machine guns, the, even the helmets that American soldiers wear. They're all French, because even American industry isn't ready to go. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Congress takes four days to declare war for World War I. And, of course, uh, by the next cycle, uh, Wilson loses Congress. It, it, one thing I will admit, I haven't looked into that much. What's the mood in Congress uh, as far as support for him? Uh, the war, the, the, as I recall, the, the vote. The vote is not as one-sided as it, 
is in World War II and it's in a couple of hours yeah. and there's only Jeanette Rankin. Right. It, it is still pretty one-sided. The, the debate in Congress is over Wilson's Declaration of War speech, which I tell my students who are Army colonels to read because I think it's the most American document ever written. I mean, it could have been, the sentiments could have come from any American president since. Wilson says several times, we're not making war on the Germans, we're making war on their government. What our, our war goals will be different from the British and French. We're not fighting for the things they're fighting for. It's the first declaration of war in American history in which the president comes right out and says, we're not going to take any territory, unlike, say, the Mexican War or the 1898 War. We're not taking any territory. We don't want any money. We don't want anything. We don't want anything. We're fighting for this series of principles. And there are people like Theodore Roosevelt who are like, you're out of your mind. Like, why would you say up front? Why would you limit yourself that way? And why would you distance yourself from the people you're going to be fighting next to? So the debate in Congress is over what American, what the American war really ought to be about. I think more than it is yes or no. And some of the votes against are from people who just don't think Wilson's made the right kind of an argument. And most of these folks know it's going to pass anyway. So they can go back to their constituents and say, look, I tried to press the president to go in a different direction. Well, what this means is once the war, once the shooting's over on November 11th, I think the vast majority of Americans think, great, we're done. And then there's this furious debate, what should the peace look like? And I firmly believe the disillusion the United States felt about World War I is not the war, which they fully believed we had to fight. What they're disillusioned by is the screw-up of the peace which includes this issue of Japan, what to do with Japan. That's what they're furious about, that the peace actually comes out worse than the situation we had in 1914. Well, is the, is the 1918 election not a result of the, the casualty figures that are... Not sure. I think part of it is the normal way that elections swing in off years. So in 1918, it's an off, it's right. an off cycle year. Uh, but remember, Wilson was never a particularly popular president. He won the 1912 election because of the split in the Republican Party. And the 1916 election was the closest American election until 2000. So Wilson's not a particularly popular president in the first place. Uh, and there is an argument coming from the Republicans, one wing of the Republicans especially, which is saying, look, when this war gets done, we have to have a better understanding of what we're trying to do than Wilson. I mean, how do you build something on the 14 points? It doesn't make any sense. Right? This is their argument, right? That what we need is a solid state of the principles of what it is we're trying to accomplish. The 14 points isn't going to get you there. My favorite quotation from the entire war might come from George Tomaso, the, the French premier. When he read the 14 points, he said, this is interesting. God himself was content with just 10. <laughs> <laughs> there are people in the United States saying something very similar. Like, what, what is this? This isn't a statement of war names. It's a statement of high principle. That's not what we should be doing. So I think some of that's going in. I also think it's also true most American elections do not turn on foreign policy. And this is true in 1918 as well. It's, it's local issues, it's economic issues that the American people are talking about. The vast majority of American elections, if you actually go and look at what's going on, this is true in 1916 too, the candidates are not, for the most part, talking about foreign policy. It's true in 1916 also. Is the problem with Wilson that he was an academic? I mean, I wouldn't. If 95% of the academics I know, I wouldn't want anyone I would, I near a political that. system. But as um, a president? But I don't, I don't, I think his problem. You know, there were many people who believed deeply in Woodrow Wilson. There were many people who believed lock, stock, and barrel in Woodrow Wilson, which is part of the problem. When he can't deliver, they get disillusioned. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's, I mean, you know, part of this is structural, too. He was, a, if, he was a professor, right? He was a professor and president at Johns Hopkins, president that's at right. Princeton. Uh, if, if, the American, if the American Constitution said treaties have to be passed by a simple majority in Congress, in the Senate, the U.S. would have joined the League of Nations and ratified the Treaty of Versailles. But the structure says two-thirds, which was a standard they couldn't get to. So it's obviously not something John Adams was thinking about, but it ended up being really, really important. If it had been a simple majority, you're in. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. If we can give him another round of applause. <laughs>